My name is Riley Bjornsson. This is Friday, November 4th, and I am at the Utah Valley University George Sutherland Archives in Orem, Utah, interviewing Diane Bjornsson for the purpose of the Utah Women's Walk. Um, today we are going to be talking about Diane's life and her contributions to life in the state of Utah. Okay. Um, first question is, where were you born? Well, I wasn't born in Utah. I was born in Idaho. Moscow, Idaho is where I was born and raised. I was born in Gritman Memorial Hospital, and it was during the Second World War. Um, my dad was in the military and was not with my mom, and my mother did not have a car. And uh, But there was a fellow that lived in an apartment <clears throat> up above uh, my mother, who did have a car. And so when she went into labor, she took the broom and poked the ceiling <laughs> so that he would know that it was time. And um, uh, he came and took her to the hospital and took care of my, my older brother, who, Humor, who was three and a half years older than I was. Um, my mother, wanted to have me on Valentine's Day, which is February 14th. But on February 13th, a storm occurred, a, a winter storm occurred, and it uh, caused my mother to, um, her water to break, and so uh, it was early in the morning, and um, she went into the hospital, and the doctor who uh, delivered me, Dr. Claren. Um, he got in a little fender bender on the way to the hospital because of the snow. And um, my mother had, um, with her first birth, had they gave them lapping gas or whatever to calm them down uh, before. And with my brother, she'd had so many problems with him. Uh, in getting him to nurse and to feed, and he just slept for the first week he was born, that she was bound to determine that she wasn't going to have any drugs when she had me. And um, I'm sure my mother was screaming and making quite a fuss just before I was born, and the nurse was going to put the gas mask on her to calm her down, and my mother told her, I do not want this. And uh, the nurse went to do it anyway, and my mother slugged her. And I had a drugless delivery, <laughs> and I am very thankful to my mother for that. I always get a kick out of that. But I was born February 13th, 1944. 13 has always been my lucky number. Um, and uh, my mother was really strong and healthy. She was only in the hospital a day, and there were, were maybe two, and when they usually kept them for a week, but they had a lot of women come in that were giving birth, and so they sent my mother home uh, early. And, but for a day, she had a roommate, a Mrs. Peterson, who actually had her baby on Valentine's Day, and um, his name was Lonnie. And I went through school for years with Lonnie Peterson. It was a very small town and very few things. And Lonnie always got his birthday on the 14th. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I'm glad I was born on the 13th. And um, my dad was in the military. And so I think within a year, anyway, my mother moved down to be with her parents for a year in Bancroft, Idaho. They lived up in Kelly. And uh, she taught school. My mother was a school teacher, elementary school teacher, and she taught school for a year in Bancroft until my dad finished with the military, until the war ended, whatever. And um, my parent, my grandparents took care of me. and. Um, this makes me cry a little bit. Um, I think that the, the first years and uh, even the beginning moments of a child's life, et cetera, are so important to establish that um, 
a feeling of being loved and connected and bonded. And I, my grandparents, um, although I can't remember because I was so small, I know that they did a wonderful job of taking care of me because all my life I have known that they loved me so dearly. And that was always a support to me, that their love that they had for me. And uh, so I feel like my beginnings in life were very solid and uh, have served me very well through, um, through the rest of my life. And um, I had the opportunity to work with a rad child uh, for a year, reactive attachment disorder, when the child doesn't get attached as an infant. And um, it just uh, made it uh, come stronger to me, the understanding of how important those first few months and years are in a child's life to have that bonding and attachment uh, when they first come into life. And that is one thing that um, I, I think is very important for women to understand is, is how important they are in a child's life to begin with. And even the greeting of a baby and uh, the baby being with the mother immediately after birth is so important. Okay. Um, can you talk about where you went to school as a child? Well, after my dad, uh, the war was over, my dad uh, went back, he worked at the University of Idaho, and so I went to school through my years. Um, there, I, I, um, I, I really enjoyed school. My mother was a teacher, elementary teacher, and always worked in the buildings that I went to school in. And so it was, um, I could always, after I got through with my class, go down to my mom's and help her, you know, put her displays up and, and help her. My mother was really a master teacher, just incredible. And uh, I went to Russell School and, um, Actually, buildings have always been really important to me. I have an incredible feeling for this actual school building that I went to. Um, then uh, I had fifth grade in the junior high, and then at sixth grade, they built a new uh, grade school, uh, West Park, over uh, under the un university, um, down from the hill, and it was a demonstration school. So. Um, my mother was a teacher there and I got to go because she taught there and, and um, actually just probably a few years ago my daughter Agatha actually taught in that school while her husband was going to the University of Idaho and, uh, and my grandkids went to the same schools that I went to and I went to um, uh, Moscow High School, and when I was in high school, I was into chorus, and I was into journalism. So I, I, um, I was on the newspaper staff and the yearbook staff, and went to a lot of little conferences for journalism here and there, and also uh, weekends where they'd have singing workshops, different places, and um, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your mo mother and the influence she had on you? My mother was a guardian, uh, personality type. She was, um, guardians keep the world together. <laughs> in, in other words, they do all things and take care of all people. And so my mother was a very good caregiver. And as I say, she was, uh, I always admired her so much because of her skill as a teacher in um, teaching kids to read. And um, she, in her classroom, 
she had different levels, you know. She never had the kids all together. She took them according to where they were and uh, that kind of thing. My mother was an extremely honest woman and um, I trusted her and loved her just dearly. Um, I think that uh, the challenges that we we receive our challenge in life when we're in our a child before eight or at least 12 in that range of time. My uh, personal philosophy about life is that we are here to learn and develop and become better people, better beings. It isn't so much what we actually do, but it's who we are and, and what we go through. And um, I believe that most people's challenges in life are set as they are children. And people have individual, um, individual challenges. In other words, we're all different. And we come with different personality types. I happen to be um, a Myers-Briggs personality type, an INTJ which is a rational strategist. And uh, this personality type is not exactly the best personality type for a female, okay? And as a child, I was always a little resentful of men because they could always do things and had more flexibility and so forth. And it seemed like women were always kind of put down. And the challenge that I received is, a lot of it is basically from my father. My father was um, a wonderful man, uh, but he, and I love him dearly, but he was verbally abusive at times toward me. In fact, would stand me up to the wall and verbally abuse me, and it was like trying to suck my soul out of me. And. Um, I always uh, I maybe carried a, a bunch of, a little bit of shame in my family of origin because my father um, was a little abusive in this way. But uh, I learned from it and was strengthened by it because of, about a junior in high school, I um, started standing up to my father and although he would get very angry at me, I would just continue and eventually he got the idea and so he discontinued his behavior. And I think that it, it, it did me well. And so I, I learned that I, this was a real major thing in my life. I think, you know, I was 50 years old before I started to really were consciously at forgiving my father for the abuse and his treatment of my mom and brother too a little bit. And I, I, uh, I worked really hard doing that. And I, in the process, I came to understand that part of the forgiving was me changing my behavior toward my father that I had to change in this process in order for me to truly forgive him. And what I had to do and what I had to change was, my dad had the victim cycle um, and so I needed to, as an adult, I could do this, reflect back to my father when he was, when he started to play victim and could not, um, was not really on, quite on. In other words, we all color our experience. We, we look at things from our own perspectives, but try to bring him back, back more into a reality mode. And uh, that was a very difficult thing for me and a very difficult thing for my father. Um, because he, um, he, 
yeah, it was extremely difficult for him. But my take on it was that, you know, I love my father so dearly. And he was um, a, a, a bully in a way. And so during his life, people were a little afraid of him and would not reflect back to him things that he was saying that were incorrect. And because of that, he was not learning the life lessons that he really needed to learn. And if you really love someone, you want them to learn what they need to learn in this life. And so you need to have the courage to reflect that back to them so that it is helpful to them to maybe internally try to restructure or whatever. But that is something I've learned, that my behavior made a difference on how well I could really forgive my dad. And I was able to really do that. My dad came and lived with me um, about a year and a half before he died. And I thought, oh, it's really strange that he would pick me to come and live with, because really, I'm not that great of a caregiver. And, but I really was the only one he had left because it was only my brother and I, and my brother had passed away. But um, after he died, I, the day after he died, I woke up and said to my husband, I said, you know, I am absolutely clear here. I love my dad and um, I have forgiven him and uh, everything is okay. And that was a wonderful experience. But I just, you know, women in their relationships with their husbands, their fathers, their brothers, whatever, whatever they need to forgive, uh, sometimes we need to change our behavior toward them in, in order to have that, you know, cut off and taken care of. Um, so he was not only abusive to you and your brother, but also your mom as well? Yes, yes, um, he was. And, and emotionally, he was, he was a very honest, fantastic man, but he emotionally couldn't deal except that. And, but he, you know, I know he's done that since he passed away. And, and I'm sure my mother gave him a little lecture after. <laughs> after he, he got there, but, you know, he, I know that he's learned that now. In other words, it isn't just this life, I believe that the next life we learn too, but we, we should learn everything we can while we're here. Okay. And um, divorce wasn't a prevalent thing back then, is that what your mom didn't? You know, a, a divorce was not the thing back then, and women were, um, didn't have as many options and were not as empowered as they are now. So the things, the challenges that I got from the experiences with my dad and my parents were number one, attack and annihilation. That was the feeling that I got and having to overcome that. Number two, women are stupid. <laughs> and number three, women cannot write. They're not smart enough to do that kind of thing. And so those are challenges that I have had to overcome in my life. And although intellectually, as a child, I knew that that was incorrect and it was not right, but emotionally, you still get whammy and you have to work through the emotional part. So um, your mom, is that where you went to for support when you couldn't get it from your dad? Like well, it's a whole family dynamics. In other words, my part of the family was to the peacemaker to make sure my dad was emotionally stable when he came home in order for him not to erupt because most of the time he was great, okay? He was a fa fantastic man. But do you know what I mean? That, that was kind of my job and, and that was a hard one for a kid to be responsible for. And when your parents are thinking about a divorce and they go through, you know, the thing. Then I was a mentor to my mother 
And, you know, as a child, that is a hard thing. That's a hard thing. But it was not, you know, how would someone be supported and, and so forth, you know. And that, that was kind of hard. My mother was actually a very strong woman, and, and um, I, I can see her smiling down at the family and the experiences that the women have gone through and saying, yay, go for it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Are there any memories that you have growing up good, that can be good? Or what? Oh, you know, I really had a wonderful childhood. Um, it was back in a very innocent time in a small community and I, um, you know, I had so many opportunities to do wonderful things, develop my talents. I took ballet, I wanted to become a ballet dancer. I took voice lessons in, in uh, high school. I wanted to be a torch singer. Uh, I just, I had good friends. I was quite lonesome though because there were only two in the family. <laughs> uh, I had an older brother, three and a half years older, but um, I, I really had a, a very wonderful, wonderful childhood. Can you explain some of the historical events you lived through, such as? Um, oh, you know, actually, uh, the difference between when I was a child and what life is now is, is so incredibly different. Um, I, uh, of course, was born in uh, World War II, and um, I, I can't remember that, but, you know, we talked about it for years. Um, I lived through McCarthy, and uh, my dad thought McCarthy was absolutely terrible, and um, at the University of Idaho, they, they were making people sign a pledge that they were, do you know what I mean, pro-American and so forth. And my dad had been in the military, had been in the Second World War, and he didn't sign it because he thought it was so silly. And I remember my parents debating over this and talking about McCarthy and so forth. Um, I think I was in um, junior high when we first got a TV uh, black and white, that was absolutely incredible. Um, I, uh, I remember uh, Nixon, President Nixon's fireside chats with his dog, and he would be saying things, and then he would have this little look over to the side of, are the people really going to believe what I'm saying? And we used to laugh and laugh at that. Um, and uh, I, um, when I was in sixth grade, um, it was the second term of Eisenhower as president, and we got really active about uh, being in the campaigns and had little I like I buttons, and my sixth grade teacher was um, an Adelaide Stevenson. Uh, fan and very strong in the Democratic Party and I remember the day after the election she missed school. <laughs> she didn't come to school. Uh, but anyway, it was kind of fun and of course Eisenhower was a sh shoe in. I mean, he was practically worshipped because of the fact of his work during the Second World War. Uh, but that was really fun. With, you know, I've seen, uh, oh, I never thought, you know, the year 2000, I thought, wow, I don't even know if I'm going to live into that, that year. That is so far away. That is just like a millennia away. And so that was real significant to me. Um, Edward R. Murrow? What? You listened to some of his speeches, right? Edward R. Murrow, the news anchor? The what? The news anchor, you know Murrow, Edward R. Murrow. 
Oh yeah, I, I remember that. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite understand you. Um, yes, we watched him and we watched his news and um, I've always been a great fan of history. Um, I love that in high school and in college and um, another thing I never thought I would see is the uh, Iron Curtain coming down. Never thought that would happen in my lifetime and that happened in what, 90, 96, 7, 8, 9, something? 89 or something. 89. 89. Okay. I've lived a long time. 89. In 89. That's right. Uh, but I never thought I would ever see that. I cried buckets of tears. Just, it was so fantastic that that happened. And uh, so a lot has happened in the world since I've been around. And you're a baby boomer, right? I am a baby boomer, you bet. <laughs> and another event you lived through was uh, the Vietnam War. Yes, I did live through the Vietnam War and um, and was very thankful that my husband did not have to go. Uh, he got called up for a physical just after we were married. Uh, we were in San Diego area and uh, boy, I prayed hard that he, he would not go. And my husband is actually brilliant. I'm a linguist. He, you know, speaks, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight languages and can, do you know what I mean? Uh, n can read tons of other ones and so forth. <laughs> and he is physically very strong, but he, he flunked <laughs> one part of the test, the one where you put little pegs in the places, especially relationships are not his thing. And he couldn't put the pegs in the right thing and he flunked it and they rejected it. <laughs> and I said, yay. I didn't want him to go to Vietnam because number one, I didn't want him to be away from me, but I think war um, is emotionally extremely hard on the men that go there and they have so many things that they have to deal with when they return. And I, I didn't want that to, to happen. And I was not uh, into, uh, you know, going to Canada to, to avoid getting drafted. Uh, I w would do, be willing to, for us to do our duty, but um, I wasn't terribly supportive of the Vietnam War, although I think some really good things came from it. And uh, also, I was overseas for a while during the Vietnam War, and uh, in Finland, and they were very anti-American because of what we were doing. So I experienced that. So did you experience uh, the fear of communism going through different cities and the states? And oh yes, and I still have it. <laughs> it was embedded in us so much. And we used to go through little drills for getting nuclear attacked in school. You know, you'd get under your desk and they'd have these drills. and. Um, I remember when I was at the University of Minnesota, I was there for a year uh, working on a master's program. They had, at that time, these films, little films that came out, one from England, and um, they, uh, you know, they give you the real bright attack, and you, you'd see it also when you walked out of the movie, you would be waiting for this this big, big attack and, and lights flashing and, <laughs> you know, yeah, they really scared you half to death. So, <laughs> did you happen to see anyone lose their job or if they were uh, called a communist or did you see anyone's lives fall apart because of that? I do think at the University of Idaho that some of the people in the philosophy department at the time that they had to sign the things who were opposed to it uh, did kind of get in trouble, but I'm not quite sure. So a lot of people usually don't talk about the history in their interviews, but history is important to me, so that's why I asked about it. Okay. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about how you met your husband and where you were? 
Hmm. I met, uh, I'm uh, LDS, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and um, I, I was in a graduate school for the, at University of Minnesota, and I thought that I would, um, I, I felt like I ought to go on a mission, so I put my papers in and I just left. And I went to Finland, and uh, I am not really language proficient as far as learning other languages, but I did meet my husband there. <laughs> and I had a wonderful time. Uh, Love the Finnish people and the culture and so forth. And did quite a bit of service, especially in the office. I worked as a secretary, you know, three times to the president. But um, I met him there. He was a missionary. And we went to a choir practice uh, across Helsinki and I heard this really good tenor. Wow, that's really an exceptional voice. And um, so on the way back, the missionaries were all on the same buses and, and we stopped and chatted for a minute. And um, he, um, uh, let me see, come to find out, he was um, a nephew of my bishop, um, my old bishop, and um, he asked me about their kids, and um, their children were younger than I was, and it came out how old I was. I was actually 23 when I went on my mission, and I thought, this is, I'm awfully old to do this, but I feel like I'm supposed to. And he laughed at me because I was so old. <laughs> and. Um, he, um, we, w we were in the same areas quite a bit when we were in Finland, so I got to see him every once in a while. And actually, we sang uh, duets together at about three weddings in Finland. And uh, then when I got home, I wrote him a little bit, but then he wanted to not write until whatever because he wanted to concentrate on his missionary work. And um, he stopped by to see me on his way home. <laughs> the elder in the office says, well, I was in the Portland area, I was teaching school there. And he says, well, you know, we could route your trip fr from Finland through Portland before you got to San Diego. <laughs> And um, I had no idea about this. And he, um, he came, um, I was uh, living with a family in, in Portland and I was, he came to the door, he told the taxi man, well, I don't know if I'll be uh, really accepted here or not, but he came to the door and, um, and uh, the, the man of the house uh, answered it, and I was across uh, the way, and I heard his voice, and I ran to the door and gave him a big hug, and <laughs> he looked at the taxi driver and said, well, I guess you can go, <laughs> okay. And he stayed all night, we went to the zoo, and he proposed to me, and then <laughs> left a, uh, went home the next day, so. And he wasn't released yet. As oh, he year. wasn't released yet. <laughs> I don't know. And then we got married in the, in the summer, but, um, yeah. And where did you get married? We got married in the Los Angeles Temple. Okay. And to just backtrack a little bit, where did you go to college? I went to the University of Idaho. I did uh, apply to go to BYU and got accepted, but my patriarchal blessing said that I should go where, uh, you know, where I was there. And so I did. And my college experience was really a wonderful time in my life. I, um, hmm, I did a lot of things. I, I did go through Rush. They have and uh, joined a sorority, uh, Kappa Kappa Gamma, 
which were, uh, I would say, actually the best sorority on campus. Of course, I'm prejudiced. No, I don't really care about that kind of thing. Uh, that's not me. But anyway, I did, and I had a lot of opportunities. I, my uh, personality type as a, uh, I'm a strategist um, makes me so that I am uh, really good at organizing things. And I worked uh, in the student union and, and um, uh, did, uh, well, ran a lot of activities, uh, was a regional um, a student union officer. I, um, I was very active in student politics. I actually was president of the campus union party, which was the largest political party on campus. I was a member of the, um, they had kind of a board, a student board that was like eight people or something like that. And I was on that main uh, governing board and from that board became the, the secretary of the Associated Students. Um, I, um, I was a member of Mortar Board. Uh, I was uh, voted in as an outstanding graduating senior from the University of Idaho. My senior year, I um, didn't live in the sorority. The sorority was a little restrictive. I'm, and uh, you know, they were trying to make us all ladies. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? A certain thing. I, I just am not quite like that. But anyway, my senior year, I actually um, lived and was a um, an advisor in a woman's dorm. What they had done, which was very poor thinking on their part, was the the girls that had gone through Rush, okay, and had not made it into a sorority, um, they all stuck in one hall, Pine Hall, because the other living groups were full. And so if you lived in Pine Hall, you were all freshmen, they were all freshman girls, okay, and you had a little tag on you of rejected, okay. And so I was um, an advisor to them, okay. <laughs> and actually, I got uh, one of the gals elected as the secretary, I mean, the, I don't know, the secretary of the freshman class, okay. I worked politically and got that done and really tried to, to uh, help the girls in what I was thinking about that time was that I wanted to actually uh, work in a student union with um, student activities for the rest of my life. And that's why I went to the University of Minnesota for a year before I went on my mission. And that's what I was working for, but I never finished the degree there. And what did you get your degree in? Educational psychology. And that was back in the days when they were saying it was politically correct to say, well, I don't know if our profession can really help you. <laughs> I, I laugh about that. But I've always been interested in why people do things and, and you know, what's a good way to help them to correct this. And so I, it, I, I learned a lot. I, I learned a lot. Um, when did you start studying herbs? Mm. Let me see. Uh, probably... Mm. My husband went to... Uh, maybe I should just... My husband went to um, Indiana University and was getting a doctorate in Uralic I'll Take Studies, okay? And... Um, we had gone to Finland, he had a Fulbright, and we went there for, during a, a winter. And um, 
we came home and here I had um, uh, two little boys and a set of twin girls. Okay. And I was actually pregnant with uh, another baby and uh, we didn't have any money. And so I came back um, he went to Indiana University to finish uh, his last semester or so, and I went to my parents in Moscow and stayed a couple months there, and then went down to uh, Eric's parents' home. They had moved from California down to Pa Tempe Hot Springs in southern Utah. And um, I went down there and was um, it was while I was there because his parents were really into holistic health and I met they had a lot of people come in and give lectures here and there about different things and uh, Dr. Christopher came down and I met the Christophers and got to know them and uh, Dr. West and a, a lot of different people and so I got into um, uh, holistic health and herbs and um, Eric had always been into that um, but I wasn't raised that way at all I, um, and but it they worked and so it seemed logical to me so I started pursuing uh, educating myself actually to begin with with um, the how to use herbs and so forth and natural healing and then I went through the School of Natural Healing um, in Springville and actually have lectured for them and went uh, have lectured a few times in England for a national um, college of herbology over there and of course my specialty is uh, women's health because I'm a midwife in that uh, more pregnancy and birth and that kind of thing with the herbs and a few years ago uh, I had a friend who talked me into buying a herb, little herb company f from him and we built a commercial kitchen and and I do um, herbal preparations and things like that um, and our website is sunstoneformulas.com and you've been doing the herbal business for how long? Uh, maybe five years, but I've been doing formulas and stuff for years for the women I work with. And I think the one thing that, that um, particularly that that was helpful to me is that I developed, before I started becoming a midwife, I developed a real trust of the human body and that things could be done naturally and that trust in the body has really been, was instrumental in me, I think, becoming a midwife. So um, I, I, I think that has been very helpful to me. Okay, can you tell me a little bit about your kids and how many you wanted to have, and their names, and a little bit about them? <clears throat> I love my children very much, and I suppose to me they're the most important things in my life. Um, I always wanted to have 12 children, and the reason was <laughs> that I, um, I was lonesome as a kid. There was just my brother and I, and he didn't have too much to do with me, and so I, I was lonesome. I wanted a big family. And um, so, and I was old when I got married. I thought I was 26 and I was so lonesome then when I got married. And um, so uh, immediately I wanted to have a family. I don't think my husband had ever really thought about it, but, uh, but <laughs> I immediately wanted to start. And uh, Thor, Thor Aaron is, was our first baby. Uh, born in San Diego, um, I really didn't know at that time anything about childbirth or whatever, and uh, I knew which end the babies came out, but that was about it. 
and um, I had I went to Dr. McCandless. He um, he was the doctor, and um, I really didn't um, I didn't really know how to take care of babies or anything. I was the youngest in the family, didn't really babysit a lot, uh, and. Uh, my husband was much better at working with the baby than I was, but Thor Aaron, he is uh, named after Eric's great grandfather, Icelandic, the Icelandic side, and uh, he has always been so fun. When he's around, life is always interesting and life is always fun. He is um, a, f a physical therapist, a, a assistant, whatever. He does the physical therapy and and uh, works on people. He is a healing type of personality. And then um, we, s s Finn is our second son. Uh, he's named Finn Boyi, actually. Uh, split the name in half, so his middle name is Bogey. And uh, he was a natural birth. Uh, it was pretty exciting for me to have him um, in Caldwell, Idaho, where my husband was teaching high school for a year. And Finn is a musician. He is a, a producer music. He is does the music behind Cascade, which is probably one of the most famous dance DJ, group. Yeah. yeah. DJs. Um, and he is very very gifted musically. He is my personality type. Uh, as you look at our family, we have no guardians in our family, mostly idealists. <laughs> with a few rationals stuck in and a couple artisans, um, which is kind of an unusual structure for a family. Um, third, I had a set of twins, uh, Gwen, named after my mother, and Grace, named after Eric's mother. Uh, couldn't be more diplomatic than that. Um, Gwen is a massage therapist right now. Um, Grace is getting her doctorate at U of U in um, city planning, green stuff. Uh, she's my personality type. <clears throat> uh, then Agatha is next. Agatha is the teacher. She actually has a degree in dance from, from uh, Southern Utah University. Um, she is a master teacher, just like my mother was, and uh, my husband's personality type, ENFP, a champion. My husband is a champion, and that has been wonderful because he's championed me in my work that I do as a midwife. And um, Agatha, at this time, and her family live in the addition to my house, and I get along with her so wonderfully because as I say, she's the same personality type as my, my husband. I love her very much and her children. It's wonderful to see uh, the grandchildren and see them grow. Uh, next is Christian. Um, his name is really Einar Christian Bjornsson. He actually graduated from UVU. A lot of my kids graduated from UVU, loved the, this. Uh, university. He graduated at age 16 in biological sciences uh, with an associate and um, finally got, didn't know exactly what he was going to do, finally got a bachelor's in uh, psychology, but he is an attorney, um, uh, graduated from the University of Utah Law School. Um, then uh, Gunner, Gunner Leif, he is, uh, goes to UVU and 
He uh, works for um, uh, Culinary Crafts. His wife works there. And he also is into videoing and things like that. Uh, Sophie. Sophie is next. Sophia Christiana. Um, she is getting into natural things, which I am excited about. She has rheumatoid arthritis. It hit her at age 25, and that is a hard thing to swallow. And uh, her husband is just started UVU, his first um, semester, and um, he is doing marvelous. Uh, excited about them. They live with us. Our house is full of people. Never a lonesome at all. And then um, Deanie, we have a daughter named Diane, nicknamed Deanie, who lived about uh, five months. Um, loved her very much. And then our last little surprise baby was Riley. At, I thought I was completely through uh, into menopause, that I was done and uh, thought I was just gaining weight. You know, I always laughed about women who were obese and never knew they were pregnant. <laughs> well, anyway, my dad's joke was, here I have this, this uh, daughter who got pregnant and didn't know she was pregnant until, and she's a midwife until she went into labor. Well, I was in denial pretty much and thought I needed to go to Jenny Craig to get a little bit of this run off. And, and uh, uh, one time I was in bed, I told Eric, I said, you know, I think I have a tapeworm, feel this. And Eric put his hand on my abdomen and he says, oh, Diane, that's not a tapeworm, that's a baby. <laughs> and we laughed and laughed. We thought it was the funniest thing ever. But anyway, so Riley came along when I was 45 and was a real blessing, has always been a blessing to us and uh, real thankful. She has uh, the only, fin well, Gwen has Annalie. Annalie, her middle name is Finnish, but Riley is a, um, a Finnish name and uh, I'm the one that named her. My husband and I had to take turns on the girls because we never would agree on the names. So uh, the boys, we could have had, you know, at least 100 and agreed totally on those, but the girls were harder for us to name. But um, I, I think I have received more joy in my life from my children and my family than, than anything. And I, I think, um, uh, one thing that I would really recommend for those of you that are just starting out your families is to learn um, learn as much as you can about parenting because we're really not taught and none of us have very good examples. In other words, my parents weren't the perfect parents. I certainly was not a perfect parent in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> I hope that when my kids get to be 50, they can start to forgive me for all the things that I did that were wrong. But uh, my husband and I never agreed on how to raise the children, and that was really a very, very hard thing in the dynamics of the family, because I was kind of always the bad, had to be, you know, this is where it's at, and discipline, and my husband was always the you know, pow, okay. And so huh, I think it would be better structured in a family if the husband had my personality type and the mother was my husband's personality type. It actually would work better. But I, I think that for parents as they raise children, that they really ought to take opportunity to take classes and get educated and read and discuss and talk about how they want to raise their children and how they want to structure their home rather than it be hit and miss and be in, being inconsistent and so forth. Because um, as I look back over my life, if I could start raising my kids now, I would do so much a better job than what I really did 
and um, uh, I, I haven't those years go so fast when the children are growing up it's just kind of like a blink in the eye and you know here they're gone and that time has passed and although we are still parenting <laughs> continually I think you could parent to the end of your life with your kids but but I do think that that is an important area that married couples really need to work at. And you know, I've taken a, a lot of um, marriage and family therapy classes, um, non-degree seeking at BYU, um, in the graduate departments, and my husband has a, went and got a, a degree from University of Phoenix in counseling, but still, we, we still didn't do uh, as good a job as we would have liked to. I guess that's kind of what I'd say, and I just think that that's an important part of our lives, the most important core thing in our life. I have such a feeling of family and the connection, and connection to my mother and my grandmothers, particularly to the woman's side. And I know, you know, for generations back, those women are working to help and direct us and keep us going in the right direction and that bond is so close and that family history bond is it's so important and to uh, share those stories of our ancestors with our children and for them to realize the heritage that they have i think is extremely important um when what was the event that made you want to become a midwife, or when did you decide to become a midwife? Okay. Well, <laughs> let me get a drink here. When I went to college, I thought anyone that went into nursing was just, uh, oh, no, it, I couldn't understand why anyone would become a nurse and want to do that kind of thing, okay? of caretaking and taking care of people. <laughs> and um, uh, I had never, would never have gotten into uh, midwifery, I don't think, but I, I mean, it's the last thing on earth I would ever expect that I would end up doing it. But my, um, my grandmother was a midwife. My father's mother was a midwife, um, Mary Ellen Gittens Green. And her husband died when my dad was about four years old. And um, she would go out and assist the doctors, the doctors in that area, uh, take care of the women and so forth, and then assist the doctor when he, after he came, and if he didn't get there, she'd deliver the baby and whatever. And I really didn't even know what a midwife was, and I really didn't know that my grandmother was a midwife. It didn't mean anything to me, and I didn't understand it. Oh, my grandmother was kind of like a practical nurse. Besides being a midwife, she would go out if someone was sick, and, um, you know, if they were dying, she would take care of them. That's what midwives did traditionally. They were not just only for women having babies, but, and she, I knew that she said that, you know, if someone lived past four o'clock in the morning, they'd live another day, <laughs> she, she'd go out and help them. But after she died was when I started getting interested in having a, um, out of hospital birth experience and I had studied my family history and the women in the family for generations had done fine with childbirth in other words there hadn't been any really messes up and they had their children their children lived and and uh, so I, I started thinking about it and we 
um, when we went back to Indiana for my husband to uh, get his doctorate, um, I became pregnant and I thought, oh, I would very much like to have a baby at home. And so I called around. Uh, this was, you know, um, 37 years ago or something like that. And there was, wasn't anyone that did assisted with home birth. So I was very um, conscientious about finding a doctor who was really naturally oriented. And that paid off really good for me. I ended up having a set of twins and I was able to have them naturally in the hospital. And, um, but this desire for finding someone to assist me to have a baby at home was in my soul. And um, after we came back from Finland and I stayed at my parents' house and then I was pregnant going down to my uh, in-laws, I decided that I was going to have my mother-in-law deliver the baby because I was bound and determined that I was going to have an out-of-hospital birth. And it really was disconcerting to my parents and family. My brother, who was attorney uh, in Boise, contacted me and said he'd pay for me to go to the hospital. I said, no, <laughs> there is just something in me that I need to, I want to experience this. I know that I'll be fine. And um, my, um, I found out the day before I went into labor, because we, I was living at the hot springs, someone came into the hot springs with a new baby, and come to find out this lady had had her baby at home, and Dr. Plunkett, the, the local doctor, had come out and had delivered her. And I thought, oh, well, I'll call Dr. Plunkett tomorrow. Well, I did call Dr. Plunkett the next day because I went into labor the next day. And I called him when I was in labor and said, Dr. Plunkett, I, I want to um, have my baby at home. Would you come and deliver me? And he said, well, come into my office and I will, you know, check you and make sure everything is normal. And if it is, then I'll come out and do the delivery. Well, I went in and everything was normal and he came out and delivered the baby. And um, my husband was not back from Indiana yet. I think it was a week. Um, he came in a week after she was born. But Thor, who was always curious, wanted to see the placenta and so forth, so he stayed in and was there when uh, I had the baby. And um, it was a very wonderful experience for me. And the doctor charged me about $250. And I um, received in the mail from my grandmother, uh, not the one who was a midwife because she was dead, but my other grandmother, about $250 in the mail. And I didn't tell anyone how much it cost, but she was really proud of me. She had had all her babies at home, and um, so she she gave me um, she gave me the money and it paid paid for the baby. And I named her Agatha. Agatha is um, my favorite aunt's name. I loved my aunt Agatha and uh, was very c close to her. And she was a genealogist for the family. It was very much in family history. And my husband had. I came back a week later and I said, I'm sorry, you don't have any say. She is Agatha and that's, she's already Agatha. But about uh, a couple weeks after she was born, um, my in-laws were very much into holistic, natural things and actually my father-in-law was in charge of a little herbal organization down there in Southern Utah. And they had a speaker come down uh, to speak and we went back down to the Dixie Bank or whatever in the basement and um, it was a midwife from up north in Utah. 
up in from this area, Provo. Uh, actually, she lived in American Fort, Polly Blanc. And she came down and talked and told about what they were doing. They were beginning to deliver babies. And uh, she was starting to train midwives. And um, it, it was all hush-hush and quiet. Uh, but I, at that meeting, it came to me very strongly. Oh, I need to be involved with this. There is something about this that I need to be connected with this. And um, fairly soon after that, we moved up to this valley. And of course, we didn't have a cent. My husband is just through school. But I bartered with Polly Block to take her class. Um, and um, uh, what I did was I typed part of a manuscript for a book that she was writing. Well, I went to the classes and they were in somebody's basement and it was a really hush-hush thing. You know, what we're doing may be really illegal in this state and uh, the midwives that were just starting to practice uh, had had some policemen follow them and check them out. And I think part of this stems from the fact that uh, home birth had been continued in Utah from um, by the uh, polygamists and the uh, community and uh, they were kind of a hush-hush kind of society and you know were illegally m married or in relationships in the state and so it had this real privacy type of attitude in it. Well, I took this class from her, which was, you know, maybe six weeks or something like that, once a week that we went to it. And um, you weren't supposed to tell anyone that you were involved in it and so forth. But I came to the realization that I was really supposed to be a midwife. And um, it was a real strong feeling that I had. And my attitude was, well, if the Lord, and I really feel like this came from the Lord to me, because I certainly wouldn't have gotten this by myself, that if he wanted me to do this, then it was okay. I was supposed to do it. And why shine your light under a bushel basket if I was going to do this, and the Lord wanted me to do this, I was going to be completely open, and I was going to um, uh, be open about it. And um, of course, I, uh, the midwifery community was just starting to form in Utah at that time. This was in the very late 1970s, okay? And actually, uh, midwifery was emerging all over the United States in the same way. It was like it was just coming out of the woodworks in, in all of the different areas. And um, so I went forward and uh, got all the training that I could at that time. I, I, there was a little steady group association of Home Birth International. Um, it was a correspondence course out of California, and you know, you read about 50 books, a lot of the medical texts, and answered questions and so forth. I went through that training. I um, went down to the Payson Hospital and went through the EMT training so I could work on it on a ambulance. Um, I took some classes from a naturopath who delivered babies in Utah. He was part of the fundamentalist community. Um, and I took classes from another gal that had just started to practice. And I received a blessing from a friend um, about that time. And he um, said in the blessing, that 
it was extremely important for midwives to get trained. And um, that uh, I would be instrumental in training midwives, and that was a, a, an important thing that I should be doing. And that it was urgent, okay? It was urgent, it was very important. And I thought, how could I feel any more urgent with this? I feel like I have a fire under me. I am supposed to be doing this. This is the most interesting thing that I, I've ever been uh, involved in. It's, you know, it's so much more interesting than anything I studied in college. <laughs> But the thing that upset me was that midwives did not have what I considered to be adequate training. Um, I, oh, in the things I did, I went down to California and went through a week seminar on, on um, midwifery out of, from the maternity unit out in Texas. Um, and while I was there, that was really a crucial point for me. Um, there were a lot of women that came to that that were practicing midwifery already. And I felt like they were not very knowledgeable, that uh, I knew tons more than they did. I was kind of comparing my knowledge level with theirs. And so, it was at that time that I figured, well, it's time for me to start my own practice. And I had a friend that I started with. Before this, I did do apprentice training with a midwife that had moved up from California. And she started a birthing center uh, up in uh, the Ogden area, uh, south of Ogden. And um, I worked with her for a while and um, we had kind of a falling out. This was just before I went to California to that thing, that conference. I had, there was a, an old statue on the books here in Utah County that anyone could go into the county health department and sign on the line that they were a midwife. And I went in with a friend of mine who was in the same ACHI thing, and I signed that form that I was a midwife. And I don't think we both did, and I don't think they'd had anyone sign it for, you know, 100 years, whatever, sign up as a, a midwife. And that irritated the lady that I was apprenticing with. She said the other gal, it was okay because she'd actually delivered a baby, but I had never actually delivered a baby when I did it. I just thought, well, this is this legally would be a good thing to do. But anyway, we had a running out, and I finally just started with a friend who had delivered a baby, um, and uh, we started our practice. And I think for the first 25 births that I went out to, I was always knew before I went out to the birth, what kind of complication I was gonna have. And that was really a comforting thing. I knew what, <laughs> what it was. So, uh, but after that, that went away, but it was a very nice thing to help me uh, in the beginning. And um, I went through um, uh, this whole, process of going through this was very emotionally traumatic because I, in essence, had been rejected by the people that I was training with. And um, actually, I learned some great things. I have been training midwives for years and apprenticing them, and I learned to value them, help them, encourage them, uh, and and not uh, speak badly about them. That um, what they're doing is a wonderful thing and they're a great help to me. And, and so that's kind of where it was. Well, anyway, in 1980, I did start um, Utah um, Midwives, uh, Midw oh, 
I, it, it's changed the name, but it was uh, you know, Utah School of Midwifery. That's what it started out to be in 1980. Because I thought, do you know what I mean? If a woman is going to be a midwife, she ought to have really good training and, and feel confident when she goes out to do it. And there just wasn't anything available. So I thought, well, of course, I'm going to start this and I'm going to organize it. And there were a few uh, midwifery, just a couple around the country, and they were set up on a, a way of just kind of packets, you know, you did packets in certain areas, but I thought, oh, if a woman is going to go to this much study and this much work, she ought to have a degree, a degree in midwifery, rather than just, well, I got a certificate somewhere to do this. And so I set it up, I set the, um, it was a school then, I set it up according to like a regular college or university with classes and so many credits for this class and that one. So I organized it all in this way, which is very unusual. I think in the midwifery field, the only ones that do that are ones that are, are there's a couple associated with, with colleges in their state. But anyway, so I, I started working on this. And at the same time, the incredible thing throughout the whole United States, uh, as midwifery started to come up and home birth started to emerge again, um, there became national organizations, MANA, Midwives Alliance of North America. Um, Midwives Alliance of North America started making standards of practice things that midwives should have in their training and et cetera and et cetera. Starting to standardize the profession. Um, after MANA, then there became NARM, North American Registry of Midwives. North American Registry of Midwives developed a certification, a national certification, so that people could actually um, uh, prove their training, uh, their apprenticeship, and so forth, and take a national test and become nationally certified. This was extremely important. Then, the next part was uh, Citizens for Midwifery, Citizens Group, which helped trying to legalize midwifery in all the states and then Meek, Midwives Education Accreditation Council. And Meek started to run a, an accreditation program for midwifery schools and colleges. And they ran a first uh, level, or the first round of accreditation. And I looked at that and thought, well, <laughs> I think it's very important for the um, Utah uh, School of Midwifery to become accredited. So at that time, we changed the name to um, Utah College of Midwifery and um, offered degrees, we're offering degrees in this process of, of how we wanted to become accredited and we were the only, we went through the first round and the only college that offered degrees in that, in that first round. And um, we had to really stretch, we had to stretch our program and do a lot of things in order to qualify for the accreditation but it was the best thing that we ever did because the college got better and better and better. And um, I actually became a member of the Meek Council and was their secretary for uh, a little while. But then the, my main purpose was to actually understand and learn the accreditation process really well. But I also went and site visited other schools and help them 
in their process of becoming accredited also. But I quit that because I didn't want to spend that extra time. I was president of the college at the time and I had two, uh, had my own midwifery practice and had too many other things on my plate. But um, that was very important. Um, in that process, which is really interesting, okay, um, I had to become accepted by the Utah Board of Regents. And of course, midwifery was not really a acceptable profession at the time. I suppose I would say that in a way. Uh, it wasn't the normal thing and kind of suspicious and, and maybe people looked at it as not being really credible. And so I kept uh, <laughs> corresponding and working with the uh, Board of Regents and they just didn't do anything for me. And I had to get accepted by them in order to get accredited. Well, this wonderful angel that worked for the Board of Regents, the secretary up there, her name was Mrs. Goebel, okay? She had a grandmother who was a midwife. <laughs> and she was my advocate. And she worked and pushed and stretched and whatever. And we finally got accepted by the Board of Regents and as I say, she was in the right place at the right time to help us and blessings on, on that lady. She, she, she was fantastic as I say, never would have been able to manage that without her. But uh, we were able to do that and then we became a tax exempt, uh, not for profit organization. I, um, and um, after 20 years, I was president of it for 20 years, but by that time I was really not doing justice for it. Um, it was time for me to let go and let someone else do it. So Holly Richardson was um, president for a couple of years and then uh, Jody Palmer, became president. I had started to groom her quite a few years early and had gotten her on the meat board so she understood the accreditation process. And she was president for quite a few years and then right now it is Christy Red Young who has been president. And these women have just made the college flower and blossom, have done just great work. I have been on the board, I'm on, still on the board, and I do still teach in the college. I teach um, labor and birth and immediate postpartum and then complications for that section. I still teach um, for the college, but uh, uh, as I say, these other people have done just uh, marvelous work and we have I have always had uh, wonderful women who are teachers and, and um, uh, administrators. And it is a correspondence school, so they do have to come in and be checked off on skills, and then they have to have their apprenticeship, um, so they get their clinical experience. But um, basically it's correspondence for women you know, who have families, babies, live anywhere in the world. And the college has probably about 150 students. And we do a lot of work uh, with Canadian students um, and are right now in the process of, of working with some of the Canadian legal sections to make sure that we're accepted throughout Canada. Um, one thing that was really uh, important uh, during these years was the legalization of midwifery in the state of Utah. And I worked on, um, well, earlier in, earlier in um, 
the history of midwifery in the state of Utah after we formed a midwives association and so forth. There were a couple forces that were really into getting us legalized through the legislature and I was very, very opposed to it because of the fact that the profession did not have a strong enough foundation. So if we would have been licensed at that time, they would have taken all sorts of things that we do in our profession away from us. Um, for instance, our profession is an aut autonomous profession, okay? If you, let me just give a little difference between um, a direct entry midwife, which I am, and a certified nurse midwife. A certified nurse midwife goes to school, becomes a nurse, and then have, gets a master's degree in additional training in midwifery. I am a direct entry midwife, which means that I enter my study directly into midwifery without being a nurse first. The certified nurse midwives went through kind of a very similar process than we have gone through to become licensed maybe about 75 years before we did. In other words, that is the first midwifery group that came up. They were nurses and then they came to license themselves as midwives. But in the process, they gave away their autonomous rights. In other words, they needed to be supervised by a doctor, okay? And this has caused problems because they have to follow the protocols of the doctors in order to stay licensed. And in some states, for instance, like California, uh, certified nurse midwives can deliver at home. But in the state of the U Utah, that has not been the case, although I know some of them that have done it, okay? But they have to get the doctor's support and the Utah Medical Association has clamped down and said, well, you can't do that. And, and, uh, and just like the doctor, Dr. Plunkett, who delivered me my first baby at home here in Utah, he was in, in a way kind of pushed out of the state. In other words, the doctors, the AMA Utah, have wanted control and didn't like that and so caused, caused, caused some difficulties. But anyway, in order for uh, direct entry midwives to be licensed, they would have to be autonomous. In other words, be their own profession and not be under a doctor. And that is a big, was a big stretch. And so without all these foundations of, of um, that have come through these different organizations, that could not happen and licensing in Utah would have completely destroyed the profession. And so I was very anti-licensing. My basic philosophy is buyer beware, okay? I don't even know if I agree with licensure, but I do believe that if midwives are carrying drugs like Pitocin, that they should be licensed because they need to be accountable for doing that. But anyway, um, so I was very adamant against not licensure, but I always said there may come a time when it would be appropriate to be licensed. Well, um, the midwives organization voted to go for licensure and I thought, oh, the time isn't quite right. That was my feeling. But actually they were right. It was a good time and it took five years of struggle. Um, com it was five years, okay. <laughs> of a lot of struggle. Uh, but finally, midwives became uh, legal in the state of Utah. And uh, I was on the 
committee for two years, two of the five years, the first two years. Then I had some other problems and things come up, so I wasn't able to continue on the committee. But basically, Holly Richardson was the committee chair, Suzanne Smith, and Heather Johnson. They are the wonderful women who helped carry this uh, through the, the legislature. But my job, and what I think I helped in this process for the first couple years was to make sure that it was voluntary licensure. I, I think that that is um, extremely important because um, our profession, historically, in the state of Utah and in the Western United States, was women who just addressed a need. And in the LDS Church, the midwives were called and set apart. They were just called, and most of the time, a lot of times, it was the Relief Society <laughs> and a president who got called to be the, the midwife. And the LDS Church set up training to train the, the midwives from all over the Western United States. Women came in and then went out and functioned as midwives. And my thought was, you know, in times of disaster or hard times, uh, women are always going to be having babies, and uh, medical facilities may not be available for them. And the right for women to go out and assist and help other women should never be taken away from them. I think this is, and home birth and all of this is a great important women's right, right, um, women's rights. Well, anyway, my function in this was committee, I think, was basically to make sure philosophically they were set that midwives could practice without being licensed in the state. But if they wanted to use um, Pitocin, uh, other drugs related to childbirth, uh, prescribed Rogam for RH negative women, then they really needed to have a license to be able to do that. And that is the way that it has come out. And Utah has the best uh, legislation of any state in the union. It's still illegal in some st a few states to be a midwife, to practice as a midwife. But you know, that doesn't stop it. It still goes on. There will always be midwives out there. Um, and I, yes, I think that Utah did a great job. <laughs> and it was because the legislators are, I think quite, at that time when it went through, were very uh, freedom oriented. And, and um, the timing was perfect, as I say, it took five years and so much work, but that would not have been able to happen if we did not have a midwifery college in the state of Utah that was accredited. That was a piece that was just instrumental in being able to pass legislation to uh, legalize midwifery. And I can see in the future um, uh, midwifery training actually coming out of some of the state institutions. UVU <laughs> eventually might have a, um, a midwifery department and train midwives. All of this would be wonderful because we need lots of midwives to service women. Um, what has been some of the responses from some of the doctors that you've met towards you being a midwife? And mm, well, um, I think to begin with, it, it was pretty bad. In other words, doctors were not supportive. And um, I had a lawsuit against me uh, paid by 
some of the doctors at Utah Valley Hospital, uh, but it was not a, a good case and I just had to wait it out. And it was actually a good experience for me. I learned a lot from, from that. And I was blessed all along the way. So, um, but there are doctors that are supportive. And but one thing that I think has been wonderful about the state of Utah and working here is that if you need to transport a woman into the hospital, there are usually doctors there who may not uh, agree with or appreciate that they wanted to have a home birth but are good men and want to do the right thing and help the people out and give them a good experience in the hospital. So um, I have always felt like this was a, a good place of practice, you know, even if I have uh, been public ridiculed by doctors and all sorts of people because of what I have done, but you see, this is the process and and part of of the experiences that I had as a child that made me ready for this and able to do it. How many babies have you delivered? Um, I've helped with uh, you know over twelve hundred deliveries, and that's a lot of babies for home. You don't just walk in and catch the baby. You might be there for two or three days, depending on how long the labor is, and and that kind of thing. And you've never lost a mother, is that correct? I've never lost a mother, no. But you've lost a couple of babies. I have. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of people, women think, oh, wouldn't it be just wonderful to deliver babies? And, you know, it's such a wonderful <laughs> experience and whatever, and it is. But there's a downside too. In other words, I have delivered babies that died most of them were conge had congenital problems, um, but uh, death is a part, and life is a part, and you have to work with both of them. So, along with working with the college, you also worked out of your home. What decided? What? Why did you decide to work out of your home? Mm -hmm. I work out of my home because I raised a large family and I didn't want to be gone. You know, when someone goes into labor, there's nothing I can do about it, I have to go. So you have to be so flexible. You never know when you're gonna go out and what you're gonna do. It's not like you can schedule them for induction and go in and take care of them. Uh, but I like working out of my home. And now there are birthing centers um, where people can go in and midwives go in and work and. And sometimes that's a good thing for midwives too because they can say, well, I only work these hours, do you know what I mean, instead of you're on call 24-7. But, uh, and I think the birthing centers are great because women who are not quite ready for a home birth can still have access to um, a midwife and a natural birth because they can't have drugs during labor, you know, outside of the hospital. and. Uh, I think it's a much better experience for them and the baby. So um, it, it's a wonderful thing, but I, 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 I like to just work out of my house. Do you have any advice for women in Utah in general or for people who want to become midwives? Well, I'll, I'll say about women who want to become midwives. I think, to me, it is crucial that you get um, adequate training. In other words, to get the best credentials you possibly can. I'm very pro women's education. Women should be educated. Whether they're a stay-at-home mom or whatever, they should be educated and, and I think get, get degrees that they possibly can because they never know what they may need it for in the future. But raising kids, you have to have a lot of skill and, and knowledge too. But for women that are interested in becoming midwives, I think they need to be serious enough about it to get the proper training and to um, 
uh, get really good credentials because you don't know the the profession is still young and you don't know what's going to happen in the future and you don't know where you're going to move to because it's different in every state uh, what things are required for you to be able to practice and so forth so um, that is probably I think to me the most important thing um, do you think you would have liked to have been a stay-at-home mom, or do you, would you have rather have done both, the mothering and have had a job? Mm -hmm. I, I did chose, choose to work out of the home so that I was there <laughs> most of the time. Uh, but I, um, you know, that's a hard thing for women. I think that um, we need to be creative in whatever we're doing. I, I thought that the family was really most important, but I spent, have spent so much time in my profession and, and doing it and working with it. Um, I think that if I would have taken my creative abilities and worked them totally within the family unit, I could have been satisfied not doing anything else. But with my personality and my brain is always going like this and I'm always thinking, <laughs> strategizing as to how to do this or whatever, um, I, I really needed a profession I really needed another profession to exercise that, I, I would say. I didn't need to, but I did. In other words, I could have exercised that all within the family unit and my kids would have had a lot better, <laughs> better time. But um, I, uh, I wanted a big family and that was most important. And actually midwifery is a wonderful thing you can work out of your home and uh, you can schedule as many clients as you want. If you don't want a big practice, you know, you can do a couple bursts uh, a month. It's just up to you. And so I think it is a good profession to mesh with the family. My family did actually really good for the first 20 years. I mean, 10 years, I'd say first 10 years the second 20 years or so, I've been doing it for over 30, I think was harder on the family as I got more irons and more fires and, and we're doing this and that. But uh, I, I do think it is a very good profession for women to do and women should be actively involved in uh, not only their family's life but doing service and helping other people in, in whatever ways. What would you say has been your biggest challenge or str struggle in life? In life? Hmm. I think one of the most important things is just keep going on. In other words, life, um, I've learned an awful lot of things through midwifery and one of them is that even if you're doing something good, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And when women come in and they're pregnant, I think, oh, what a wonderful thing. They are growing a child. It is the most wonderful thing that a woman can be involved in. Her life should be easy, <laughs> but it isn't. She may not have enough money. She may have problems with her family. Uh, do you know what I mean? Things aren't perfect in her life, but still she is doing good things and going forward. And um, I, I think that in life we, we have many hard things that we have to deal with and have to do, but we just need to keep going forward and doing our best. And. Uh, and if we feel like we're supposed to do something, even if it's really hard, that's okay. 
we're, we're doing good and we're developing as a person. Have you received any awards or gone to um, anywhere to do talks or anything about midwifery or received any kind of award? Mm -hmm. Let me see. I just got at the the uh, uh, Midwives College of Utah banquet teacher of the year. <laughs> uh, and I. I don't really, um, yeah, I, I would just say that those kind of things are not that important for me. Um, what do you want to be remembered for? Hmm. hmm, I would like my children to remember me with love. <laughs> I think that that is the most important thing. Um, I, hmm, I would like a lot of the women that I've helped with their deliveries and so forth, to remember me with love too. Um, I've given them a lot of love, and uh, I have received so much inspiration from the women that I have worked with. Birth is not an easy thing, and to do it naturally for many women is a very, very difficult process. They, I have so much respect for women and what they do in the process of birth and how they get through it. It is a real intimate uh, activity and um, to be part of that and to be part of their lives in doing that is absolutely just phenomenal. And I would like them to remember me that I did have love for them and was as helpful as I could be. And, you know, I have my bucket list that is this long, of course, with me. Uh, I could live another couple hundred years and not be bored one bit and not have, uh, you know, be uh, idle at all, always working. And um, I am, my, one of my goals right now is to start to writing and putting out some books so that I have 30 years of experience and I think that I have learned some valuable things about birth and, and the process and want to be able to share that to women so that it can be helpful to them. And so I, hopefully I will be giving some service in the future with writing and, and things of that sort. Do you have any questions? Or? Um, have you gone back to, say, the, the same woman several times and delivered several of her children over time? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that, I think, is we get more of that in Utah because they're big families, okay? And let's say you uh, deliver seven babies for someone. Do you know what I mean? You get to be a good friend. You know them. You know what they do and you feel for them and and um, I uh, always felt really bad as a child because I didn't have a, a sister to my mother came from a family of five girls and we'd go visit in the summer and they would have the best time sitting around gossiping and working on you know making a quill or whatever they had so much fun I was so jealous I didn't have that opportunity and I am actually an introvert and so I don't go out and socialize a lot but these women coming back for baby after babies it is such a joy to me and their sister coming in and do you know what I mean getting to know their mother and and uh, like it, it has been wonderful and as I say that is a real treat that we get in Utah that they don't have in as, as many places, other states, <laughs> because we have big families. And so you've undoubtedly seen children that you've delivered as grown-ups or as maybe teenagers or... Mm -hmm. um, and I've actually delivered people <laughs> that I have delivered. Oh, okay. delivered. And, and then I thought, man, I really am getting old here. <laughs>
I'm, I'm delivering babies for people that I've delivered. And, you know, you get an idea of, of uh, you know, and their mothers come, that you help them. You know, mm -hmm. it is, it's just a glorious experience. Yeah. And they, tru they trust you, and you're like part mm -hmm. of their family, so that's yeah. wonderful. It is very good. Have you ever had to be out, into, out in a very rural area where there was no other medical backup in case something went wrong, or is that a, a worry? Um, it's always nice to be fairly close to a hospital in case you do, but you know, my transport record is very, very low. Um, probably two to three percent, and most of those people are really high risk in the beginning. Okay. But I have delivered babies out in the mountains where there's no running water, no toilet in the house, no electricity. I have delivered babies in, you know, mansions. I, just the whole spectrum of life. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it just it's really interesting. And I think one thing that I really enjoy is I enjoy going into people's homes where their babies are born because as you look at their house, you know, you get a, a bigger picture of who they are, what they are, their pictures on the wall, do you know what I mean? The way they decorate it, you know, and, and it, it's fun. You, you get, to, their personality is expressed by their house, I think. And do you, you mentioned high risk, do you get to know ahead of time whether someone, say it's their first child, but they they have diabetes or, or something that could put them in a high risk. Can, can you say, no, you shouldn't have a midwife, you should go to the hospital? Or well, definitely we risk people out in okay. a, as, as we do it. But I am really um, very strong on first-time mothers having home births because of the fact that first-time mothers have longer labors. They're, mm -hmm. they're they never really, um, their body hasn't done it before and it takes them longer. And the longer they're in the hospital, and you know, labor hurts, mm -hmm. uh, the sooner they're gonna get an epidural. As soon as they get an epidural, uh, then that affects the baby and their risk goes up higher for getting uh, a, um, a C-section. And so I really think that it is, the best way for a first-time mom is to go for a home birth, and once she has had that natural birth, the next time it's a lot easier, and she can get through a hospital experience without an epidural and without a lot of the things that that, that go with it. So I'm I'm very pro first-time moms going for a home birth, and if she really does need a C-section. You can take her into the hospital and she can get one, but she'll know that she really needed it rather than it just be a cycle of events that kind of happened and then the baby got into stress and so forth. So. The babies are a lot more alert too when they're not on drugs. I've noticed that. Mm -hmm. they're, they're right there because they haven't had drugs in them and, and so they do a lot better. And that's one reason why home birth is, and our statistics are so good, and actually it's safer in the end, why I'm, of course I'm a proponent of home birth, is because the mothers do not get medicated during the labor, and that makes all the difference as far as how the babies respond, so. And then also the mother gets to be with the baby, which I know is one thing you don't like you know, about hospitals, because they take the baby away from the mom and they're in the nursery. Yes, the baby gets to stay with the mother. We pull them right up on the mother. And you know, for the baby to come into this world, okay, that their security is their mother. And to be next to their mother is the most healing thing. They know their mother's voice. They know their dad's voice. They, they want to be with their mother. And to take them away unnecessarily is, is, interrupts the bonding and stresses the baby out a little bit, so. Any questions? Okay.